Don't forget that if you're 13 years old or older, you need a license to fish in Tennessee. Unless you're fishing on property that belongs to either you or your parents. Now you can purchase your license online at tnwildlife.org, your direct link to the TWRA. On this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal, we'll look over the shoulder of those taking part in a bat blitz and find out just how important it is to monitor the health of these unique creatures. We'll float down the Buffalo River and see an all-out effort by volunteers spending the day being good stewards and cleaning up one of the most popular scenic waters to float in our state. Then we'll hop on a boat with one of our TWRA stream crews to search for broodfish who will spawn the next generation of stripers at our hatcheries for the coming seasons. We'll hear from a citizen responsible for rescuing a bald eagle and learn the fate of this symbol of America's freedom. Then, spend time on a dove field during a hunt held exclusively for youth, and we'll witness the real-time mapping of the Caney Fork River. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is opening the cover and inviting you in for a behind-the-scenes look at the work being done every day by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Let's turn the page. What kind of legacy will we leave when our days upon this earth are gone? Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun care enough to be the keeper of the dream thanks for joining us on this episode of tennessee outdoor journal our first story of the day banding bats for research am i going out too yep come with us we're here at the bellamy cave refuge in, in montgomery county and what we're going to do is we're going to catch the bats emerging from the cave using these harp traps here. So the bats will actually fly in from one side and they'll actually attempt to avoid this first strand. Um, some can see it, some can echolocate these strands. And as they turn sideways, they'll try to attempt to fly to the other side. They'll hit these right here with their wings. They'll fall down. Our typical methods we use to catch bats like mist nets, it's not something we can use here because there's so many bats that exit this cave. Uh, each night in summertime that we couldn't process the bats and get them out of the net quick enough and that would do more harm than good. So we use the harp trap. We catch them safely. If we don't get them out in time, then they can actually roost inside the trap. 17.5. And then we're gonna weigh them. It's gonna be a non-reproductive female. Assess the reproductive nature of the bats. Look for wing damage uh, from white nose syndrome and then put a band on them, which we can use to track the bats if they're ever recaptured in their life. We've been very fortunate here in Tennessee. We, we've got a, several projects where we work with threatened or endangered bats and, and get, to, get to chase them uh, with our cars and contractor planes. And here we get to, to band them real quick. It's a lot of work in a short period of time. And, but it, you know, over, over the course of a couple of years, the work pays off when we start seeing our bands popping up at various places across the range. Yep. Mm -hmm. We try to get as many people as possible. Since we're working with an endangered species, uh, we can't hold them for very long. Uh, the longer you hold them, the more stress it puts on the animal. So we get as many people up here to get the animals uh, captured out of the trap, in a bag, processed, and let go in as short a period as possible. We've actually been banding here for several years uh, to try to get as many bands out. A uh, colony this size, we can't capture every, every bat to band them. Uh, so we use this one one night each year to get as many bands out as we can and hopefully track them through time. Uh, basically with the band recovery, we're getting a, a straight line uh, recovery from where it was banded at to where it was recovered at. And at this site, uh, a lot of these bats here get recaptured or we recapture bats that use the Fort Campbell area. Uh, but we've also recovered bats from as far away as Shawnee National Forest in Illinois. And these bats have been recovered as far south as Fern Cave in, in Alabama. So we get a a, a movement pattern across a very large uh, part of the, the range of the species. Female, juvenile, non-reproductive, zero. There's both a maternity colony and a bachelor, so 
they segregate in the cave. The females will use a uh, different section of the cave for the, from the males, so we'll get a sex ratio of the actual colony. Um, how many of them are the females are, have given birth this late in the year, they should have already given birth, so we'll be able to assess if, if they were pregnant um, or if they're lactating. Um, then we'll be able to see if there's any impacts potentially from Watno syndrome, uh, since it is in this cave in the wintertime. Here at this site, we're hoping that we, we continue to see the, the positive results or positive uh, things we've been seeing with gray bats. Gray bats have, have not had the declining numbers as with uh, other species of cave bats in Tennessee. So by doing this, we can assess the wing damage, which tells us possibly if they're getting a, a, a pretty bad or significant infection in the wintertime from the fungus. Um, so if we do this work, it gives us that snapshot. So we're, we're hoping that, that we continue to see the good things we've seen here at Bellamy Cave. There's a, there's a lot of research going on with a lot of uh, fungal communities that, that exist on, on different uh, animal skins, particularly bats, because some species don't seem to be susceptible to Watno syndrome, and it's, there's a possibility that it could be because of those uh, bacteria and fungi that grow on the bat skin, and, and one of those species is gray bats, and, and hopefully we'll be able to um, fund some of that research in the future to see if, if possibly the fungi and bacteria grow on our bats is different than other bats and, and possibly lead to, to some form of control or uh, explain, at least at the very least, explain why bats, the gray bats here, aren't succumbing to Watno syndrome. Next up, we go to the Buffalo River cleanup. The event today is actually a partnership. It's a pretty unique experience uh, between our agency and also Buffalo River Resort. Um, they approached us a month or so ago wanting to promote boating safety, but then also to do something to uh, protect our river. Well, we thought it would be important as the season kicks off on the Buffalo River to, uh, to really make sure that the river was cleaned up from the, the winter and the floods that happen in this area and just pick up random trash and it gets deposited on the riverbanks. And so before all of our customers and honestly other people's customers are on the river, we thought it'd be a good thing to partner with the TWRA to do. Well, I've got 37 and a half miles of the Buffalo River here in Perry County. I am, I'm a little bit partial to it. We've got two main rivers and that's the Tennessee River, which is more commonly called Kentucky Lake and then the Buffalo River. And uh, we've actually got slightly more Buffalo River than I do Tennessee River, but I, I'm, I'm very partial to this river. It's pristine, it's clear water, uh, it's got a lot of small mouth in it. It's got just infinite opportunities for people to canoe, kayak, paddleboard, swim. Uh, it's just, in my opinion, one of the few rivers that we have in uh, western middle Tennessee that's still got this clear, uh, I guess rustic, old uh, middle Tennessee feel to it. The watersheds are so crucial with the urban sprawl um, in Tennessee especially, uh, but to help preserve and enhance and to bring the younger generation, get them outside, get them away from these computers, away from these phones, let them experience nature. Who knows, there's river otter all throughout the place, you know, muskrats, all kinds of snakes and fish, and even pull over a shoal, pick up a little trash and let the kids throw rocks in the water and find crawfish, you know, it's just, it's, it's an awesome opportunity. I'm, so glad not only for Buffalo River Resort to give us this opportunity, but also for the, the public to seize it and take advantage of it. Rivers, ponds, creeks, streams, you name it. Uh, you know, most, most folks that, that litter, whatever they littered with, it actually weighed more when they brought it in than it did when they left it. So if you take it with you, you need to be able to bring it back out. And it, it's just, it's, it's vitally important. I've just noticed in my lifetime, areas that I'm now taking my son to, um, there's not necessarily the focus on maintaining the cleanliness and, and you know, the look of the different areas for generations to come. And that's one of the top complaints that I get is, it's not so much the canoers coming up and down the river, but it's the trash that they leave behind. I think we can get this one more anyway. When people litter, uh, it really cuts off public access to places. Uh, private landowners that would be uh, prone to let some folks maybe put in a canoe or bank fish. When places start getting trashed up, that's the first thing that gets cut off is public access. You know, last year was our record year. So if we had a record year, odds are, unfortunately, there's a record year of trash that was left unintentionally most of the time on the river. 
it does get a lot of use and it's grown in, in popularity, I believe, in the last few years with the number of canoe and kayak outfitters uh, located up and down the river in Humphreys County, Perry County, Wayne County. And, and it's just that much more reason uh, for our agency to, to do these education events, get the word out about the, the, the positive things that come from the Buffalo River, but also to, to help folks to be more cognizant of keeping their trash picked up, taking their litter with them. Uh, it's a small river, but it's a pristine river, and it can, it can be trashed up very easily. It's a small river, but it's a very, very utilized river, and, and in order to st stay pristine, people have to really, really be mindful of keeping their litter picked up. Next up is a story about the Striper Brood Collection. Today on the Cumberland River. Every year the TWRA goes out and they, they get brood fish so that the hatchery can produce more fish. And today we're going to take a couple boats, we're going to run up toward uh, Cordell Hall Dam and uh, we're going to watch the crew see how this is done and, and what they get. What are those? So these are the these are the uh, arrays for the electrofishing electrodes. Essentially, this is the uh, hot wire and the boat serves as the ground and it pushes electricity through the water. What's a brood fish? That's the fish that's gonna spawn and have a bunch of babies that the hatchery can raise and release back into the river. This is striper brood stock fishing, and what are we doing? Yeah, striper brood collection. Yeah, okay. so we're, we're at the, uh, just below Cordell Hole Dam, probably the uppermost part of Old Hickory Lake, I guess, on the Cumberland River. Caney Fork's not far away, and uh, it's usually a good striper run this time of year. Striper don't reproduce naturally. Is that, well, is that the case? They'll they'll attempt to do that, and there's there's some cases in which they do, but the the these eggs have to be suspended for 48 hours, um, and so there the river reaches aren't long enough for those eggs to stay suspended in that water. The water has to be moving, so um, <clears throat> that's that's pretty much what limits reproduction. So not far downstream, you know, you get some calmer waters and the eggs will settle to the bottom and, and suffocate. That was gizzard shad, wasn't it? That was gizzard shad. It's a lot of gizzard shad. Perfect size, too. We came through a bunch of gizzard shad. That's the best food for going out and trying to catch these fish. And just like clockwork, they chopped up a nice striker. Woo! Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, who picked this spot? We need more fish. You want to hold the paddle fish, Ashley? He's ready to go. <laughs> now, they need to be generating a little bit or releasing some water. Just, I think the water's still falling. Looks like it's still falling. So these fish are probably holed up somewhere. They've all bunched up. It looks absolutely horrible, but those fish aren't hurt. They're just stunned. It's not making them feel great right now, but see way back there, they've already gone back down. What, I, what I'm coming to understand is that even though we have electricity in the water and we're shocking these fish up, it's still fishing. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here.
There's two down there. A really good striper fishery below uh, Cordell Hole Dam. Uh, the state record uh, was caught from the upper end of Old Hickory, which is essentially where we're at. Well, what we do uh, every year around this time, we'll, we'll collect uh, brood fish, brood striped bass, so that we can take them back to the hatchery and spawn them and produce uh, millions of eggs and hopefully millions of fry, which we will redistribute to the different hatcheries across the state. And then they'll grow them out and then stock them back into our state waters. everything today. I think we even saw a sturgeon further up river. Paddlefish, striped bass, white bass, all kinds of shad. Overall, it was a, a really interesting day to come out and, and see all those different types of fish. And we did, we were successful. We got several uh, good female stripers and we could use a few more males, but uh, I think we've got a good start. Here's a story that'll touch your heart. An eagle rescue and release. And just like that, a bald eagle rescued from the Duck River a week ago is returned to the wild. It's a happy ending that took a community effort. Well, me and my in-laws and my friend Brandon, we were out kayaking, and uh, my mother-in-law saw the eagle, and uh, we seen it, he was in the mud a little bit, so we picked him up carried him to the shore best we could, and uh, we uh, put a towel over him, got him warmed up as best as we could. Wildlife came. I've had these calls before, and this is the first time it was actually a bald eagle. Usually it turns out to be a hawk or a, a lesser raptor. No, I didn't expect it to be a real bald eagle. When I got here, it was, it was drawn up. The talons were drawn up, and it wasn't using its talons. It was calm, docile, uh, shaking. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have made it through the night if they wouldn't have found it. Uh, I took it to Dr. Stimson's house. He looked at it in his driveway and uh, said, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's no, bro bro no broke bones, no uh, you know, blood coming out of it. The biggest thing he wanted me to do was just evaluate and see if it was too far gone, and I told him I didn't think so. The legs felt fine, the wings felt fine, uh, his eyes didn't look good. Uh, he just looked like he was weak and cold. I mean, he was not trying to fight us. He didn't try to bite me. He was alert, but he was having a little trouble breathing. He was breathing harder. He was found in the river, so he was wet when Larry took him out of the river. And, you know, he was very stressed, of course, and he didn't even want to stand up on his feet. He was down on his hocks, and, and he couldn't, he wasn't even, he had his um, talons clenched, and he wouldn't really try to grab. And that's not normal behavior for a bird. If you had one, uh, they would be trying to actually bite you and trying to fight you. Uh, but he, yeah, he was pretty weak, and so I didn't know what we'd find on Sunday. I didn't know if he would actually make it overnight, but thankfully he did. I think it would, personal opinion, it would have died that night if uh, Dr. Anderson went to come, come in and hydrated it and got it going. And then we took it up to Walden's Puddle the next morning and they, they took care of it the rest of the week and got it in the flying. We were actually very lucky with this bird. This bird was found to have shot in his x-rays, but we do believe that those are old injuries. So he's been shot at some point in his life and he's recovered, luckily, very tiny shot and in a very non-critical place in his wing, so it didn't affect his flight. What happened this time, we're not sure about, but he came to us very exhausted, um, slightly thin. It looked like he'd just been completely tired out. So for us, that's a little bit of an easier fix. We support them with fluids and we support them with food and basic general supportive care. And he came back really, really nicely and uneventfully, which was nice. There's a lot more eagles than there used to be, and that's really good. And you see them much more frequently if you look around and if you're in the right places, but uh, it's still it's still nice to see it. I'm just very happy to be here to see it. I mean, it's a once in a lifetime. But I have to say anytime we can put an animal back, it's always special. An eagle is a great one because he's a symbol and he's a symbol of our country. No, oh, it was great. It was great to see it flying, as strong it was as it was flying too. Um, I'm glad that we get to see him, get him back flying up in the air. You know, it's great to see that he made it. I'm hoping one day, you know, he'll just fly down and nod his head or something, you know. Be pretty cool.
Next up, Youth Dove Hunt. Well, uh, you know, we're here in College Grove, Tennessee. Uh, uh, it's only 300 acres, but uh, we usually have a great hunt. Typically, we uh, plant and uh, manipulate the wheat that's here. Uh, work goes in to this field starting in uh, late July and all the way through the end of August uh, to try to uh, get and hold birds here. This year was, was wet, uh, plus the hurricane that came through. Uh, doves have small legs and, and they need bare ground. And um, one of the biggest things is to keep bare ground to keep the doves here. And you constantly got a disc, and, uh, but you only can plant the wheat one time. So that's a challenge. So uh, we try to manipulate the uh, ground uh, to try to give the hunters the best opportunity to harvest birds. Today we had uh, close to 25 use uh, with their parents. And uh, we had a good hunt, over 50 birds killed. Uh, and they shot between six o'clock and all the way up to nine o'clock. So they burned a lot of powder today. Uh, we got some gun cases, some dove decoys, some mojos. This is actually a dove tree. Okay. We got the local officer here, uh, uh, Cody, uh, he, uh, he got with some local uh, merchants and, and had a, a lot of uh, door prizes. And uh, uh, all the youth here, uh, each, uh, they got at least one prize. Uh, and uh, they ate hot dogs and, and got t-shirts. So it was a great time. Let's wrap up this episode with a story about mapping the caney. Caney Fork originates quite a bit east and south of here, and it of course is dammed at Rock Island and then is again dammed here at Center Hill. It originally was a smallmouth fishery, but of course when they came in and, and did the dam with the water coming into the Caney Fork, coming from below the thermocline, it therefore is a cold water fishery now. And so it has become a trout fishery rather than a smallmouth fishery. Well, this is the water quality sensor. It goes off the back of the boat. Well, I was made aware of the HDSS survey, the High Definition Stream Survey techniques, a couple years ago in a fisheries meeting. And since then, I've talked to the, to the gentleman that came up with that process and that survey technique several times, and we've tried to work it into TWRA sampling scheme and how we would use that on rivers and streams. This is for the underwater video camera. So ultimately, this will have side scan sonar, GPS, uh, multiple video cameras, water quality, and uh, all of that's linked together, and everything will be logged in this box in the back of the kayak. So. When you actually see us working today, it looks just like we're kayaking like everybody else here on the river. We turn on the equipment, it logs every second, and we're able to map both banks, the bottom, uh, the water quality, the height of the water, the depth. This is essentially the equivalent of aerial photography for the terrestrial side of wildlife management. We've never had something like that for rivers and streams. The whole point of this is we're gonna be covering, I'm pretty sure it's 28 miles of Caney Fork we're gonna cover this in two days. Every meter, we're, we're getting information every second from video, from side scan sonar, from water quality, from depth, four different GPS units, four different video cameras. Um, so this kind of opens up a lot of the things we can do in rivers and streams. Um, in the past, all we've had is a topo map or an aerial image that shows the surface of the water. It doesn't show anything underneath the water. It's essentially the uh, street maps. Uh, a lot of people use Google Maps for navigation and, and a lot of things. It's street maps for rivers and streams. This technique allows us to get what's underneath the water, what's in the water, as far as water quality, dissolved oxygen, um, pH. All this can be collected real time and then uh, tied to a GPS point so we can essentially collect thousands of points down the river and be able to look at those and compare them because the time period is very similar. The basic idea behind mapping the river and Trout Unlimited, the Cumberland chapter in specific, is that it will give us a, an idea about what is evolving in this river, how the habitat is changing, areas of the river itself that, that need work, perhaps there's bank erosion or Perhaps there's silt coming in from a feeder stream or uh, any, any, any number of things. Where we're really interested in 
the HDSS survey on the Caney Fork is over time what happens to the fish habitat and the bank stability. We're going through a period at Center Hill Dam where they're doing construction on the dam to stop leakage at the dam. Then they're gonna refurbish the generators. So they may be able to, to change their flow patterns there. And what we're interested in doing is, is capturing a base level. This is the Caney Fork in July of 2016. And we'll have that data if we wanna go back and look at the Caney Fork in July of 17 or 18 or 19 or even 2020, we'll be able to compare back to that baseline and that will be river wide from the dam to the confluence. This allows us to look at fish habitat all the way down the river. We can look at the riparian zone or the sides of the river, see what state those are in. Are they in good condition? Are they highly eroded? We can even tie it to our fish sampling. We can put a camera and a GPS on our sampling boats because we have similar GPS points all the way down the river instead of just localized spots where we, we sample or where we have access to sample in, like in years past. Trout Unlimited chapter in Tennessee has been a long standing partner with TWRA on, a, on several different projects. But they picked up the, the majority of the cost of this project and they look to benefit from this project in ways they can see the river as a whole from the dam to the confluence and pick out areas where they can do restoration projects or habitat enhancement projects. It'll also provide some mapping of fish habitat so they know where the best areas to wade or the best areas to fish from a drift boat may be. It'll allow us to do some flow models that will explain how much of the river is available to wading at low flows or how much is available to floating at one generator. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we can get out of this. Uh, we will have the data to make the maps for wadeable areas, uh, best fishing areas, and then also we'll be able to narrow down the 10 best spots to do restoration projects or the 10 best spots that we need to protect on the river. So it, it allows us to look at the whole river all at one time and make better management decisions. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We'll see you next time. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is produced by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels. So when I was a kid, I loved baseball and football and all kind of stuff, but my favorite pastime was when my daddy would get me up early in the morning, we'd go hunting or fishing. Out in the fresh air, on the water, or back in the woods, and you learn a lot. You got kids, take them hunting, take them fishing, Join me, buy a hunting or fishing license. Let's keep wildlife in Tennessee. That's a doggone good thing. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.